Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It's Susanna for my daily walk Bible reading. Thank you for joining me this afternoon as I'm recording this during my lunch break for Tuesday, July the 2nd already. Hope you have a great um, second day of July as we look forward to celebrate our Independence Day, July 4th on Thursday. Hope you have a great um, great afternoon so far. Today I'm hoping to start um, John chapter 13, but before that I'd like to say a prayer and a quick pre overview for this reading session, Ministry to the Disciples by God's Son for chapter 13, and then also it covers chapter 14 through 17 for this overview section, and then who Christ is for the July devotional. The great reflection, the time has come for the great ref for a great reflection, reflecting the Savior to the world. May I remind you as a, a child of God, we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So for those of you who just became a Christian or just join in as the body of Christ, I will also share the scriptures for who we are in Christ printed out from one of my partner's website just to introduce to you of to know who you are in Christ and to remind as children of God of who we are in Christ. But before I can do all that, I want to thank all of my subscribers. Now over a hundred of you, thank you so much for studying the Word of God. I'm so awkward. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you've given us to study your word and to um, learn us to know who we are in Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your teaching and guide. Bless all my my employers and colleagues as we work together hard getting things done to support our city in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ bless our employer and bless those who mourn for the loss of their loved one who's gone to be with the Lord and bless all the caretakers who take care of our loved ones at home who are sick or on the way to recovery I lift up these um, two sisters that's still caring for their grandmother Bless her, and I rebuke sickness and disease um, in their grandmother's body. And also, I continue to lift up my mother, continue, continue to keep her heart strong, Lord, and help her to have a positive, uh, good and positive report from the doctor this month and the next month to, to follow in Jesus' name. And also, please heal our dog courage and heal his whole body and help him to stay young and um vibrant and young and enjoy his life as you has given my husband and I and our family to enjoy and help him to be a happy dog in Jesus name. Thank you and bless everyone who needs um, healing and bless everyone who needs job promotion as you help us to excel in our workplace and help us to get up all the projects done in a tem timely manner and help us to be promoted to the next level in our career life and help us all to pass our exam and help me to study well in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you. That was good prayer, right? So who Christ is for Tuesday, July 2nd. Um, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you before Abraham, I am John 5. Uh, John eight fifty eight. as we already complete John 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and today we're hoping to start John 13. So John eight fifty eight. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. You know, God's word never contradicts himself when he said, um, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and beginning. That means God is from the beginning of your life, God at the end of your life, God at the beginning of the world creation, and God at the end of the world creation. He's always exists. That's why he is our everlasting Father, God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Consider how often we use the phrase, I am, in conversation. It is interesting to note that God used 
the phrase I am capitalized in answering question from Moses who wanted to know how to identify God to the Hebrew slaves. God's um, answer was, I am who I am. Moses was to tell them, I am has sent me to you, Exodus 3.14. I am, all capitalized, is full of the theological significance when applied to God. And Jesus used that significance to identify himself to the Jews as being one with God. Before Abraham was, I am capitalized. John 8, 58. So holy were these words to the Jews that they tried unsuccessfully to stone him in John 8, 59. Jesus went on to expand on the meaning of I am by using the phrase seven times to describe aspects of his being. I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the door, the good, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life, and the true vine. Meditating on each of these aspects of God's person in Christ reveals untold riches about who he is and what he does. Turning point, God is not the great I was, he is the great I am. I think you heard that before, friend. I know I have. By, Ale by Eric Alexander. So Exodus 3.14 is what um, God told Moses to tell the people of the Israelites of his name, I am. Okay? So that's wrap up who Christ is from our second day of July in the Reflecting the Savior to the World. So let's start with John chapter 13, and I'm going to read the overview again. Ministry to the Disciples by God's Son. The overview today's section includes what has traditionally been called the Upper Room Discourse. It actually takes place partly in an upper room, John 13 and 14, and partly in an unspecified unspec location, John 15, 17, see also John 14, 31. These verses constitute Jesus' final instructions to his disciple before his death. In them you will read of the importance of a servant's heart, the necessity of Jesus' return to the Father, and the provision of the Holy Spirit in his absence. There are many spiritual insights yet to be grasped by the disciples, a realization that drives Jesus to his knees as he prays for his followers, both present and future. So, um, as my mother already read to her, um, to her Cambodian community around the world, uh, John chapter 13 is about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And uh, and then the next few chapters, we'll be reading the fruit bearing, talking to the disciples. And then 16 future events, 17 intercession for the disciples, talking to God. Jesus constantly praying for you and I, friends, and his church. Okay, friends, let's wait no longer. I'm going to bring you closer so I can read this keeping up my time with my lunch time let's read tackle these um, 37 verses of John chapter 13 all right in the new living translation for all my new viewers so um, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to have, these, to have this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, my life I lay it down no one can take this life but I lay it down so nobody nobody killed Jesus he laid his 
life down. That's why all these things has to happen. Like Judas Iscariot, he had to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You know, all these stuff had been written already. So it's, in other words, it's like Hollywood producing a movie. It's already been scripted. So all the, all the character has to do, all the actor and actress, actresses and the character has to do is to walk the script, to read the script and act on it. So basically, this is acting upon God's word. So it's already been written in the book of God, in Jesus' name. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judah, son of Simon, Is Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So that's his mission. He come to save the world. You and I now, like I reminded everyone, now is the acceptable time to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because when there's that time come, when Jesus, you know, when you're trying to say, I want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and the door shut, that's why he said the same, the same as the days in Noah, in no way. Uh, one of these days, we're going to get back to the book of Genesis, and we're going to read about the Noah's Ark. When God has destroyed and clean, he cleaned the earth because the angel came and came to sleep with the, the man's daughter. So they became giant. So that's why God has to purify the earth again, recreation. So he had to destroy the bad and the ugly in order for him to have that open communication with human um, with um, human being again with his creation again as started off from um, Noah's ark with um, his his two sons and their daughters in Jesus name praise God praise God so there are so he and his wife and his two son and their daughters so six people on the planet including the two every two paired of the every two pair of the animal as you know the story of the Noah's ark in Jesus name ooh i was trying to wrap all that in 2 seconds wow 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 so it was time for supper and the devil had already prompted Judas son of Simon Iscariot to betray Jesus Jesus knew that the father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water in a ba into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, dry them with a the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. Don't you ever hear of your parents said that before? For those of you who had moms and dad who's gone to be with the Lord, don't you remember these words when they tell you something and at that time you might not, not think it's significant and now that they're gone to be with the Lord, you think every detail of the things that they told you, you know, it's the most significant, the most important thing of all. Not that I belittle what Jesus said to Peter right now. Jesus said, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. Praise God, praise God. No, Peter protested, you will never ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. So um, Simon Peter exclaimed, Then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, A person who has bathed all, all over does not need to wash except to the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples clean, but not all of you. He's talking about spiritual clean. He's talking about Judah Iscariot is the one betrayed Jesus. He's trying to say, all of you are clean because, you know, you love me and I love you. But there's one who betrayed me is not clean, which is Judah Iscariot. But they thinking he's talking about 
cleaning because he's about to wash those feet. Jesus knew who would betray. Here we go. Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. Praise God. Praise God. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your t Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do, I, do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Now we're going to be reading Jesus predicts his betrayer. Praise God. I am not saying these things to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but this fulfills a scripture that says the one who eats my food has turned against me. Have you ever sitting at a table and later on down the years you realize, wow, I can't believe that person betrayed me and yet she or he smiled right in my face and lied to my face. Well, this is what Jesus had to deal with. Someone who just, you know, dip into the same bowl and eat, breaking the same bread, loaf of bread, and yet he betrayed him. I tell you this be, be, uh, beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe that I am, capitalized, the Messiah. I tell you the truth, anyone who becomes my messenger is welcoming me, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. You who confess, profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, like me and my mother did, and my whole family did, is um, you accept God the Father, because Jesus came to represent the love of the Father. So when we receive Jesus, we receive the Father God in heaven, friends. Isn't that marvelous? So like um, Jesus told Thomas, I believe, later on we're gonna be read, Thomas said, Lord, how would we know the way if you if you don't show us the way jesus like jesus said haven't i been with you all this time thomas i am the way the truth and the light no man comes to the father we're going to get to that in john chapter 14 i didn't mean to spoil that <laughs> but we all read that for our for us um the the students of the word we all knew the john chapter 14 and it's one of my favorites okay i tell you this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. I tell you the truth. Anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Now Jesus was deeply troubled, and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. Now he said it out in the open to the disciples. You know, imagine you, one of the disciples. Oh, my gosh. Who betrayed Jesus, right? The disciples look at each other wondering whom he could mean. The disciple, the disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to um, Jesus at the table. That would be John, right? Simon Peter motioned to him to ask, who is he talking about? So that disciple leaned over to Jesus. That disciple means um, Judas Iscariot. Wait a minute. Let me read it again. Simon Peter motioned to him to ask, who is he talking about? So that disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? So I think he's talking about verse 23. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. So now that that disciple leaned over and to ask Jesus, Lord, who is it? Jesus responded, it is the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. So Jesus told them everything. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Is Simon Iscariot. When Judah has eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. So nobody, you know, all these things Jesus didn't reveal to the student, to the disciple, because it's all written in 
the uh, part of the father's plan. Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. In other words, the devil got into Judas Iscariot and Jesus said, well, go ahead and hurry and do it. You know, what you're about to do, which is he's going to sell Jesus to the Pharisee. None of the, or the uh, Sadducee, all the uh, religious people. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant since Judas was their treasurer. He was handling the money and stole the money of Jesus all the time. Since Judas was their treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to give some money to the poor. So Judas left at once, going out into uh, the night. Nobody suspected it was Judas Iscariot because when Jesus said, well, go and do what you normally do, basically, basically this is part of their, you know, this is part of their um, holy ritual, if you want to call it that, you know, when Jesus walked passing the poor, he would say, well, I want you to give to that person $10. Well, I want you to give to that old lady $25. And then after their meeting, Judas Iscariot, of course, who's handling the money, had to go out and take care of those business. So this, this disciple probably thought, okay, so Judas got to go and give that lady some money. As, I guess that's what Jesus meant. But this time, Jesus meant Go ahead, if you were going to sell me to, um, to the, uh, to the, um, to the Pharisee or whatever, go ahead and do it quickly, because that's part of the, uh, of the, that's part of the plan of God Almighty. So Judas left at once, going out into the night. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Verse 31, as soon as Judah left the room, Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God received glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. So now I am going, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Here's the new commandment. Instead of the Ten Commandments, friend, pay attention to this one. This is the new commandment that Jesus gave to his disciple. And now in turn to us. So now I am giving you a new commandment to love each other just as I have loved you you should love each other, which in other um, version it says, love one another as I have loved you. you love for, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciple. That's verse 35. That is the new commandment, friend. 30, 34 and 35. So Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? Here you go. You know, it's like every day at the dinner table, okay? I'm going to be here with you for a while. Later on, I'm going to be crucified. And then three days later, I'm going to be resurrected. Over and over again, Jesus has been sitting and tell his disciple this. But now they're like, Simon Peter, like, Lord, where are you going? It's like, are you listening? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord, he asked. I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. That's wrap up John chapter 13, friends. So, you know, imagine God knows your life from beginning to the end, from the day you were born to the day that you are going to be with the Lord. Can't you trust that person who is God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is beautiful. Okay, okay, okay. So I want to read some confession today of who I am in Christ. So I printed that off of one of my um, partners, one of my partner websites. So let's read 
a few um, scripture here of who you are in Christ. So we have to have full knowledge of who we are in Christ. So when the devil tried to lie at us, we're like, nope, that's not what God says to me. I know who I am. I am reigning in life by Jesus Christ, according to Romans 5, 17. This way I don't have to shout too much because of the office. I am not looking at the things that are seen but the things which are not seen second corinthians 4 18 i am walking by faith and not by sight second corinthians 5 7 i am casting down my imagination and every high things that exalts itself against the knowledge of god second corinthians 10 5 you can go all the way to verse 4 and 5. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.21. I am rooted and grounded in love because Christ dwells within me, Ephesians 3.17. I am the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus for good works, Ephesians 2.10. I am a partaker of God's divine nature, 2 Peter 1.4. I am prosperous and be in good health because my soul is prosper, 2 John 2. Don't this get excited, friend? This is the truth word about you and about me when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I am prosper and in, and in good health because my soul's prosper, 3 John 2. The more the word of God get in you, your mind, and your spirit, the more the word of God get into you, you are empowered with boldness. You empower, prosper in your soul. The more your soul is being prosper, the more it's going to manifest into your life in the three-dimensional world that we're living in the world. Uh, I am a partaker of the divine nature, Second Peter 1, 4. I am healed by the stripes of Jesus, First Peter 2, 24. I am praying my desire and receiving them, Mark 11, 24. I am receiving all of my needs according to his riches and glory in by Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 19. Let me wrap it up. I am increasing and abounding, abounding in love, First Thessalonians 3, 12. I am being made perfect. I am being made perfect in every good work to do God's will, Hebrews 13, 21. I am showing forth the praise of God, Psalm 51, 15. If that, doesn't, if that didn't encourage you, I don't know what, friends. So there you go. You have that. And then let me take... Okay, here we go. Yesterday I was reading The Old Man is Dead. So today, let's see. Dismantle an Old Covenant Mentality. So we read The Total Brand New You yesterday. The Total Brand New so we read that yesterday. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And then 1 John 4, 17. Not according to the old man in the spirit. Okay, today I want to read and then wrap up with prayer. Dismantle an old covenant mentality. Many Christians have not received the full benefit of their salvation. They're not they're so aware of their sin that they constantly fear God's rejection. They might not go to hell now that they've been saved, but they don't have any confidence that the Lord will use them or answer their prayers. This is a total wrong understanding of the true nature of God and the new covenant. This is what Paul was explaining in the book of Romans. It's his masterpiece on the grace of God. He was preaching against the mentality of the Old Testament law, where people felt they needed to perform in order for God to accept them. They believed that God gave the law to keep it. But just the opposite is true. God gave the law to show us that we couldn't keep it. It was actually given to show us a standard that was so far beyond our ability to meet that we 
would despair of self-righteousness and try to live the Christian life in our own power and ability. God wanted us to just throw ourselves on his mercy and quit trusting in our own goodness. Religion has perverted the law and told us that we've got to have a certain standard of holiness for God to accept us. Conveniently, that standard fluctuates and is never quite clear. But if we fail to meet it, then we come under the wrath of God or at the very least, he won't answer our prayers or fellowship with us. Most of Christianity in Paul's day, as well as in ours, is performance-oriented. So in the first five chapters of his letters, of his letter to the Romans, Paul dismantled that belief. That's awesome. You know, when you are learning in the church through the years, if you learn, uh, religious, it's going to take a while to unbelieve, to undo all the wrong belief in religion. Now you have to restudy, relearn of what a new life in Christ of who I am. That's why I just went through the list of knowing who we are in Christ, friend. I had to relearn a few things, like when my mother was awake after she cared for my grandmother when she was a, about to die, gone to be with the Lord and live with a missionary family for years, but didn't even know that she was born again. So my mother had to retrain her in her deathbed. And then before she took her last breath, my mother said, if you know that you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Mama, Please wiggle your, your toe to let me know that you know that you heard me and you're doing just that. So she moved her toe. This was before she took her last breath. She moved her toe and we know that grandmother has, has accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior and directed her spirit to be with God. Isn't that amazing, friend? Living with a missionary family for years and they did everything else but reading the Word of God. The true gospel raises questions and eyebrows. By the time you get to Romans 6, no one should believe that because of their own goodness. God owes them something. In fact, Paul's explanation of the gospel was so strong that it raised questions as well as eyebrows. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans 6, 1. Now, of course, the answer to this is God forbid. Romans 6, 2. A. This phrase is about as, as strong as you can get without using some type of profanity. It is an absolute unqualified negative. No, we cannot live in sin. Absolutely not. Paul was not saying to live in sin. That's not what I'm saying either. But I want to point out that when Paul taught on grace, this question about sin came up repeatedly. Romans 3, 19 through 31, Romans 6, 1 through 2, and Romans 6, 14 to 15. Most Christians would say that's a logical question, but they only be saying that because they're so hung up on sin that they don't understand what Paul was really talking about. So he answers a question that he knows most religious people are thinking. God loves you because he is love, 1 John 4, 8, and not because you are lovely. He loves you completely independent of your performance. That means he doesn't love you more if you don't sin, and he doesn't love you less if you do sin. That's the good news of the gospel. But may I add, but don't abuse his grace. As simple as that. You know, like this um, church scandal that I was talking about. So two, well, one of the Dallas, Texas um, uh, minister of God had stepped down months ago. And so this month we heard a scandal of some sexual um, dealing in the church by the senior pastor. So you probably know who I'm talking about by now. We're, 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 ta we're bringing this to light because as people going to church, having head knowledge is not going to change 
until you have a heart change. He say, if you believe in the heart, man believe in the heart and confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing that God the Father has raised Jesus from the dead is how you get born again. Until you change, have a change of heart, sin is continue, It's still going to be, you know, Christian. It's like one minister said, sitting in a garage does not making does not make you a car just like going to church is not going to make you as a christian may i put it that way so let me just wrap up and pray and pray for all the body of christ heavenly father thank you for this time that you given me and my viewers thank you for allow us to study your word thank you for making your holy word available even in the workplace even online we have the bible that we can carry with us 24 7 so i'm trying to get as many people to study god's word because faith comes by hearing as romans 4 romans 10 17 says and call those things be not as though they are romans 4 17 so father i call for all of my viewers to study god's word and to show us all so we can show us um what is good and acceptable in your sight and show us our, show ourselves a proof on us so that you we all may be be ready to answer when people ask us so what's going to happen if i'm doing this so what's going to happen if this has happened to me so what should i do so we can always have an answer for the people father because according to isaiah 60 we shall arise 61 i believe isaiah 61 arise and shine for the dark for the uh, for the darkest is coming to the earth but god has brought light upon your people thank you father help us to have answers for the world because we are the light and the salt of the earth bless all my viewers god bless you friend in jesus name amen